Hey guys, Lotus Dreams here, coming at you with uh, another Tactica session this time. Um, I decided to make a different kind of video today. Usually I do a full review of a codex or whatever when it comes out, but um, there's no sense doing that with the old codices because they're pretty old now and everybody basically knows the stunts and everything. But I still wanted to do a little bit of a highlight what I think works best, in this case working with Imperial Guard slash Astra Militarum how it's covered nowadays and I, I basically already did that on a stream yesterday but I think uh, you could do that for most of the armies since I have played all of them and there's uh, distinct stuff that works and there's stuff that doesn't work there's synergistic effects and uh, you might not know about them maybe you can get some new ideas and that's the basic idea of this video all right so let's get started what makes guard work that's the simple question and there's one simple answer to that too um, you have these guys here you have a company command platoon commanders ministerium priests and psychas to some extent um, all of these do something very well they multiply forces for example if we go over here we have a big blob of guys we have a big blob of guys here and anything you do applies to everybody here so if E issues the order uh, Monster Hunter, Tank Hunter um, or they get divination off and they say okay we're gonna make these guys overwatch on full ballistic skill or we do whatever you want basically everything you do is multiplied times 50 because there's a bunch of dudes in the same squad if you go preferred enemy to one of these guys they all have preferred enemy so in the in a sense um, they work really well with stuff that supports them and that's because they can combine squads. The Gunsman, the basic infantry Gunsman squad of uh, conscripts or normal Gunsman depending on your needs is really really good at uh, amplifying stuff that you give to them. Um, an additional effect from here is um, orders and so on are very very powerful in the sense that you have options. These guys have a bunch of options to go for and if you um, apply them to the squad uh, they can deal with most of the threats that exist in a game. Um, let's go over the troop choice then real quick because uh, it's obvious what the commander does. He does give the orders um, but we need to talk about two artifacts here. It's uh, the Walker's Cane and the Kuros Aquila. Uh, Kuros Aquila gives everybody within 6 inches a uh, preferred enemy. Keep that in mind. We have a bunch of plasma weapons. We have artillery pieces that wound on twos and that need to hit. We have a bunch of dudes that would like to reroll once because of the crappy ballistic skill. And also we can take plasma guns in the small squads as well. And we don't want to lose those because they're more expensive than usual. So in other words, that add effect is 60 points, but it's well worth it because it synergizes with almost everything you have here and um, can be spread across the army very easily since the squads are so big and you can spread them pretty hard. Or you can just hunker them down next to the artillery pieces of yours and then deal with whatever uh, is necessary and keep rerolling those ones and make every single shot count. The other thing is uh, the cane, because cane is basically uh, used in conjunction with the artillery best, but can also be used with normal guardsmen as well. Essentially, um, you have to take a leadership test every time you do the order, and uh, they can only fail on a double six. So that is quite amazing. It only has a reach of six inches then, so you have to become come very close. That's why I'm telling you artillery is probably the best idea since you're going to stay close anyway. But it is an amazing artifact. Ten points. Ten freaking points for making stuff work that usually should not work. So if you want to issue orders to the artillery or to your dudes and you don't uh, have enough leadership, this is actually a really, really good artifact for ten points. Um, can only be taken by a com company commander, so he is your dude for this thing, but in the artillery formation you have a company commander, so no problem. Then the next thing I mention here will be the Minestorm Priest, because he also is a force amplifier. He makes everybody in the squad fearless and gives them hatred, which is combined into one rule called Zealot. Uh, he can decline all challenges, he has a 4% one save himself, 
he can basically you stick him inside of these squads here or this squad here and they will never run away very very simple unless he gets sniped he uh, makes this blob of no leadership into a blob of uh, leadership 9 slash 10 when you add more stuff to it and fearless in general which is really powerful um, the platoon commander we don't have to talk much about because he's essentially the same as the company commander except he can also grab some objective secure if needs to be but it's not necessarily really a huge deal uh, the company commander can add a master of ordnance um, in case you don't know what it is it is a uh, basically an artillery strike that he can call in it always scatters uh, huge amounts because if you get it directed it scatters 2d6 and if not uh, even more. <laughs> if you have line of sight, you obviously um, reduce it by your ballistic skill, but uh, his ballistic skill is pretty crappy. So it's a crap shot whether or not you can use it. However, remember, um, in the Cadian battle group, these guys here are your only core choice, basically. You can uh, have a bunch of these and a bunch of these, so you can make an entire mass of ordnance list if you want to. It's actually really funny. I've done it once. But it looks pretty stupid because there's a bunch of roots hiding in the back and since the range is unlimited there's no reason to ever step up and then the artillery goes all over the place because it never hits what's supposed to be hitting but at least it's hitting something most of the time. So it's a crap shot over the not these guys are good but you can have them. There's also the officer of the fleet but that one is always, always uh, necessary if you running Militarum Tempestos or uh, Flyers so you get reserves can come in on a 2 plus and other than that he's good against all kinds of reserve armies since he can reduce the um, their reserve rolls by one as well so he's useful you can take him he uh, is a little bit situational that is all then let's go over to troops I always uh, talk about these guys these are conscripts conscripts have one big advantage they're incredibly cheap and in being incredibly cheap, a warhammer is a good thing because, as you can see, these guys have a gigantic footprint. So if you take 50 of these, uh, you're clocking at about 150 points plus their support, which is absolutely nothing. That's uh, like a Grey Knight squad with upgrades. <laughs> and if you blob them down, you can see their footprint is so huge. You can basically cover whatever you want. There's no deep striking here, no infiltrating. Um, no melta gun will ever be in melta range and so on so you can spread them across the map you can also do a, a front lining job with one squad if you want to they uh, provide cover stage for everybody else they're simply amazing as they are um, they have some disadvantages th uh, one of them being they can't hit anything their blizzard is crappy and everything uh, so they profit most from uh, the divination buffs or something like that um, they also have a really really bad leadership so you have to add a Ministerium Priest or an Inquisitor or both um, to deal with that problem and as soon as that's happened nothing else matters because you always take the highest leadership they can understand orders which is great because they have less guns and even a, a, a shit ton of less gun shots at some point will hurt you um, another tactic here is obviously you can see it's really hard to get them on the table so uh, adding different HQs to them has different effects. I was already talking about this guy, makes them fearless, make them better in close combat, they're not gonna run away, great, add him. Next thing is the Inquisitor, um, Inquisitor with a Psy column. If these guys here target something it's a Psyker, they have Brisket Skill 10. Why not? Put them in there, here we go, anti-psychic support. Demon Prince coming at you, no problem, we have Blizzard Skill 10 now. So we basically gun down everything on site, no problem. Uh, best best buff you can have um, for any Guardsman unit for that matter. Um, if not, Divination is, your, is the key, so that next to him we have the Psyker. Uh, we have different Psyker formations I'll talk about later, uh, how you can Im implement these, and you can also take the Primaris Psyker if you don't want to take any formations. Um, then we have the Inquisitor and there is a bunch of different Inquisitor um, setups that you can use. First of all, an Inquisitor has only 25 points. You can ally him uh, just by himself, he does not require anything else and he brings additional Warlord trade with him. So that is huge, he is basically uh, utility galore. And if you now imagine, oh yeah, we have all these conscripts but we can't get them to work. They uh, 
have to get across the map somehow. Uh, they all have objective secure, which is a big upside, but they're not there where they need to objective secure sometimes because we have too many of them. In this case, you take that blob and uh, you do something really funny. You give the Inquisitor the Liber Heresius. The Liber Heresius uh, allows him to take a leadership test and then apply Scout to him. And all of these guys here will outflank. So they're coming in here, or here, or here whatever side you're on. Basically outflanking gives this blob here a huge amount of mobility and makes sure they are somewhere and they can't get shot at and, uh, because they're in reserve. So there's no way of uh, shutting that down. Um, they can also deal very well with um, blocking the sides basically. So if you want to have some objectives on the side, that's the way to do it. Um, if you want to use these guys as a close combat unit, which uh, you can also do, add some red grenades to him, add some psycho grenades to him, and there you go. You have a big advantage over any other squad. And as soon as somebody touches any of these models, they have they are reduced their toughness by one, and they are also um, probably freaking out or killing themselves or whatever effect the psycho grenades have. Great addition if you want to just blob it down. And um, why would you want to go into close combat, you might ask? Uh, well, that's very simple. There is one Imperial Knight, there is one a uh, unit that can shoot, there's a Gargantian creature, you don't want them to shoot, you blob them up with conscripts for the rest of the game. Very simple. So these guys can be made useful no matter what. Uh, when they just clock something in close combat and that's fine. Alright, um, enough talked about conscripts, why would you take guardsmen when you have conscripts? Very simple, first of all you have to take them to get these guys, and then there's something that the conscripts can't do. These guys here can take special and heavy weapons. So what I usually do is I take 50 again, but I add in auto cannons and I add in plasma guns. That is probably the most versatile setup you have. And um, as I said, tank hunters, for example, on strength 7 is great. Why not? You can uh, threaten most vehicles and glance them to death at some point, or you just explode them. Uh, you have good range, you have solid firepower against marine equivalents and terminator equivalents with the plasma guns and uh, this basically is a way to hide your special weapons inside of a big blob of guys. That's the only thing that the guardsmen can do and that's the that's a unique ability. No other squad in the guardsmen army can do that. Uh, even the veterans can only tank 10 guys so there's no way of hiding your special weapons there. These guys here can basically make sure that your special weapons uh, stick which is good. Um, obviously, same applies as to those conscripts. Make them twin linked, make, give them uh, give them phenol pain, give them uh, re-rolling ones, which is really nice when you're shooting your uh, freaking plasma guns. They have better ballistic skill than conscripts, so they're uh, a tad better, and you can bring them up to 75% hitting chance, which is pretty good. And uh, they're not as expensive as, as you would expect. Um, their point increase is a little bit, but not as high that you couldn't run this. So taking these two blobs here uh, clocks up at about 500 points and there you go, you have 100 dudes on the field with a decent amount of firepower and enough staying power for the most of the games. Um, the next troop choice is veterans. I rarely run these guys. Um, usually you would stick them in each camera or something like that. Um, uh, the options is multiple special weapons. The big downside is um, they have to come pretty close to be effective because Melta, Plasma, Flamer are all pretty close range guns and um, it's not worth it to take just one heavy weapon because that doesn't do much and um, you only have a little limited amount of orders. So the smaller the squads get, the worse the orders get because orders are never an AOE effect. They're also, uh, they're always ordered to a single unit. That's why I don't like veterans as much and uh, Astromitarm without support is not as good. The only good thing about veterans is their ballistic skill. Obviously, plus one ballistic skill can make a big difference and they can make it count, but um, if using them, I would recommend using um, vehicles and stuff as well, so they are a nuisance, but um, they are not that easy to remove, like, okay, I'm just gonna kill them out right now, because you would never invest into armor or something like that, you have tempestos for that, um, there's no, no sense in doing that. Um, that is our troops, there is two 
different troops we have to cover still, but I uh, will not talk about them right now because they're only good in conjunction with different setups. Um, so we can go back to the normal stuff and talk a little bit about what else can we do uh, when we try to do our army concept. Because we have a bunch of guys here, but that's not really good anti-armor. Um, and I was already talking about it. This is the artillery formation. Um, artillery formation is uh, obviously the best choice if you want to deal with vehicles because they have strength 10 on the Manticore, strength 10 um, uh, Basilisk and they have ordnance, so they get two dice picked the highest when they penetrate armor, which is really nice. That is a big chance of getting a hit on most vehicles and light vehicles just get obliterated anyway. Uh, they have huge range um, Minimal range too, but that only applies if you can't see the target, so don't worry about it too much. And uh, the thing that formation grants them is the ability to ignore cover with the commander, because he can issue them orders just like to everybody else. So you can basically uh, tell them, okay, I want a pinning manticore, I want a whatever you want. <laughs> you can order it to them, and thanks to Warcraft's cane, only failing on a double six. So that is pretty nice. And there's two setups how you would run this. Uh, the, the Basilisk setup has uh, two Basilisk in the squad, one Manticore, uh, and one additional engine seer. So you can give these guys here power of machine split, so these guys can split fire but still ignore cover because you order the unit to ignore cover. Um, downside is one of these three units doesn't ignore cover, so the Manticore most of the time has so much range and so much spread that it doesn't necessarily have to ignore cover because it's shooting over something and it comes from the middle and not from the Manticore itself. So I found that setup works pretty nicely if you want some heavy hitting. And then the other setup, the safer version, is basically a double Vyvan, a Basilisk and a Manticore again. Um, so we have two units that you can order the um, the ignore cover to and the engines here can make the Vyvan uh, split fire a little bit with his uh, ability. Also the Vyvan is one of the best units in the codex so you can take the Vyvan by itself totally fine. You don't have to implement it into the formation. You can fill your heavy support slot with it and you always be fine. It has amazing damage output. Uh, only, only thing that comes um, close to that is probably the Thunderfire cannon which is a little bit better in some cases, but the Wyvern is dirt cheap and that is a big advantage in an army that has dirt cheap troops anyway. So this is your long range Dakar, 48 range, very solid unit. Uh, would always take that if I can. Then I already mentioned Kuros Aquila, great for this formation. Rerolling once to wound is great if you're doing that and um, obviously you can always roll with the uh, cane or something else. Then let's go over the top over here. Um, going on with the tank heavy stuff. Uh, Limaras Executioner, one of the deadliest tanks in the game, likes to kill itself but can be amplified to really really powerful weapon uh, when combined with Kuros Aquila because you can um, reroll all gets hot tests. So there's a 1 out of 36 chance that you actually get hot. So you destroy yourself much slower than usual. Uh, 36 range is a really good threat range and it destroys everything that looks like a Terminator, Marine or any elite squad um, in plasma blasts. Downside is it cannot ignore cover. That's a big downside actually, but that's just the way it is. And the uh, upside is it's not as... Um, expensive as you would take a bunch of plasma cans instead. Uh, the main gun alone uh, makes up for that. It is a huge investment still, so keep it away from Melta, surround it with conscripts, there you go, you're safe. Nothing happens. Um, the thing is, um, the Punisher is a very situational tank because it can't hit anything. That's the big downside of our Astromitamus vehicles and that's why the camera is here as well. They always have the same issue. Their ballistic is crappy, but the amount of guns they have is actually fairly well. I mean, all the super heavies and so on are just uh, stick, like stuff all the guns inside of there, but they never hit anything. 
and that's one of the advantages that the Y1 has. It has a blast template and that one is twin linked, so it has a very good chance of actually hitting something and these guys don't, which is not very good if you're considering the, the high point cost for each vehicle. Um, but there is a little trick that you can do now. You can ally in Belisario's call and uh, if he says so and you add some engine CS, you can basically increase your basic skill by two, which makes the punishers incredibly powerful. Uh, especially combined with the fact that you can get preferred enemy on them. So th they're looking at two twos to hit, re-rolling, and most of the time threes to wound, re-rolling once on the Punisher cannons, and that is pretty nasty. They can deal a lot of damage, they uh, can get some heavy bolters here and there, um, that increases their firing power even more. And then for every other turn you get invuln saves, you get it will not die. Uh, basically call is a very good support unit for assembly town, and he can work uh, if you want to go with uh, vehicle heavy lists. Otherwise I would not necessarily recommend doing that because the tanks don't have enough uh, punch to uh, do the job completely alone. At least uh, that's how I feel about them. Um, the other uh, Lehman Rust versions I do not really like because the Basilisk and the artillery in general does their job way way better and um, you don't necessarily need the, to go with the tank route and they will still be very expensive especially if you go on with a tank commander which most of the time you'd want because in the formation you at least get plus one ballistic skill for all uh, of these units and that means you hit on threes so re-rolling ones is already pretty nice and um, considering you can also take pask or something like that you might even get some rending on there so you can basically make the punisher into a good unit but it is not good in, in itself when you just bring it uh, stock which is, I don't know, it's a mix. I mean, conscripts are not good either when you just bring them stock, but they're dirt cheap, that's the difference. <laughs> All right. Um, what else do we have? Uh, we have some more flyers over here. We have the Vendetta and the Vulture. Uh, Vendetta is solid because it has twilling glass cannons, three of them, so why not? It also uh, enables us to do something else. Uh, it has some spot capacity, so we have six slots free. And guess what? We have special weapon squads. Special weapon squads usually have a big uh, issue. They can be singled out very easily because they cannot. They are not part of the big blob, so they can just shoot them down in case they try to do anything funny. Um, in this case, you can't because they're inside of the Valkyrie, and you can just drop them in wherever you want to. Uh, give them flamers or even melta guns. Flamers have the big advantage that they don't need orders to do anything good, and their ballistic skill doesn't even matter because you're automatically hitting something. And three flamers always hurt most of the time. Uh, it's also a cheap objective secure unit that you can drop in, and the Valkyrie, uh, or in this case the Vendetta, uh, can do the anti tank that you sometimes lack, and it ha has a pretty good chance of actually hitting stuff. So, Graph Shoot also makes sure you don't have to land it very often. It's pretty well armored, it's not as squishy as other flyers, but it is expensive. That's the only downside. Which why I wouldn't take the Valkyrie, uh, or, or any Valkyries for that matter, and the Vendetta only if I didn't necessarily need it. Um, the Vulture is basically the same as the Punisher, except it is better because it's a flying Punisher and it has um, a better ballistic skill uh, in that it can hit ground targets much better due to strafing run. And I mean, Getting in range is always an issue because it's 24 range on Punisher cans in general, so getting closer is a good, uh, good deal. Obviously, this is Forge World, so keep in mind if you don't play against Forge World with Forge World, that's it. All right, um, that is the good stuff. The only good stuff we have left here is. The super heavies. Now you don't play these very often, but you can make them work really, really good if you uh, invest your time into them. Um, I have two favorite setups. Uh, I don't play any of the Bane Bait variants except one, and that is the one that has a gigantic cover ignoring blast. Don't ask me what it's called. It might be called Shadow Sword or something like that. They are also Shadow something. Nope, that is the Shadow Sword. So that's the wrong one, that's the D one that I usually don't use. Um, I think I think it's a Storm Sword, is it? Doesn't matter. You will find out if you look through the profiles. Um, the majority of them don't have 
uh, very good profiles since they can't ignore cover and then uh, the range doesn't really do much. Um, the Stormlord is actually a very different option. He does not have the, the boom power that the others have, but he has some very, very uh, huge advantages. First of all, his uh, turret is a anti-vehicle, anti-marine heavy infantry killer. Really powerful, strength 6, AP3, a bunch of shots. And uh, obviously can amplify that with Belisarius Call if you want to. And um, he can fire all that stuff twice when he doesn't move. So he's um, as long as he is in position to fire and his range is 60, so he is in range to fire at all, at all times, he's actually really, really nasty in terms of... Uh, damage output um, and the great thing about him is he is open top so he counts as open top but he does not count as open top for purposes of actually exploding which is nice and uh, he's a super heavy so it's pretty hard to remove him from the board and you can stick all of your heavy weapon teams that usually die uh, on site in there and they can still fire because they, he has firing points so you can I think it's 20 models or something he has a capacity of 40 but you can still shoot with 20, so you can put them all inside, and you have basically a uh, rolling fortress of anti-tank and anti-marine uh, with huge range around him. It's actually a really cool use of it if you want to use it outside of Apocalypse, because in Apocalypse is probably not that good in comparison to the others. Um, I rarely play f uh, pay for the less cannon turrets, because as mentioned, their basic skill is absolutely crap. And uh, Belisarius Call can make it work, but I mean, still, it, it's too much points for the last cans. You you might as well invest into last cans on foot. They can at least um, issue orders to them, and that makes them so much better in this case. I don't know. So that's your my favorite options for the super heavy slot. And in this case, objective secure inside of your super heavy is also not bad and um, secures these guys because they're a little bit more expensive but not too expensive so you can run heavy weapon squads pretty easily with that setup. And then we have two final uh, movements here, the Hellhound, Devil Dog, Bane Wolf all have the same problem. They, As soon as they get shot at and they are shaking something they are pretty useless because they can't fire anything anymore. Um, but that doesn't mean they're bad. I mean, their their damage output is very solid. Their uh, guns can pretty much deal with most of the targets that uh, exist in this game. Um, but they have issues with um, being a fast vehicle and so on. Uh, they're usually at the front the first, and uh, that means they draw the most firepower. And as soon as that, as that happens, uh, they lose their guns or they get shaken or whatever, so they can't use their templates. So that's bad. Um, in this case, I value them as a good unit in terms of what they can do, but they're only good if you can keep them hidden, if you can keep them behind cover, and uh, the enemy does have bigger fish to fry, so good in conjunction with artillery and so on. So you don't have to use them, but in case something comes close that is scary, you can use them against whatever is coming up. That's how I would rate them. And then uh, this exact same thing over here, the Tempestus guys, um, the Tempestus Science are basically the same idea. Um, you drop them in, good in conjunction with uh, Officer of the Fleet, so you can drop them in on a 2 plus next turn. Uh, you can drop them into cover right away, it's good, because uh, otherwise they're going to be toast as soon as they drop in, because they have to go like a little bubble. And uh, they have moved to cover so they wouldn't die. Um, but still, the um, amount of damage they can put out in one turn is pretty nice. You can try to assassinate uh, heavy infantry or vehicles, because that's what they are best designed against. Um, always run the HQ squad so you can get your uh, orders on them. And then the HQ squad can also take four special weapons, not only two. Other than that, they are pretty costly. Um, they work best if you mass more of them, but if you want to go for that style, that's just ally in uh, Death Watch. They do the job 10 times better, and they are more survivable than these guys. Um, I, I don't see a reason to use them very often, but just in case you want to use them, um, you can also ally them in from the Mutarm Tempestus Codex, so they, they get objective secure. and. Um, different orders though. So you can't ignore cover anymore, but you can give yourself twin linked or preferred enemy, which is both good against um, your usual 
uh, targets, for example, meta guns with twinning is nice, very high chance of hitting something, and plasma guns always good with the reroll. Uh, then you have some different options. Yeah, but you basically you use all you lose all the benefits that Astromilitarum has to offer for them. And that is it. Um, everything that is not on the table that I did not mention is in terms of Astromilitarum nothing I would play simply because there's better options. That's all. The um, the death strike, for example, is not really bad, but there's just better options all around, and it's very expensive, so you have to be very careful with what you invest your points in, because it doesn't matter how cool it would be if it goes off. It is, if it doesn't even get to go off, you can't uh, make use of it. Um, always remember, these guardsmen and all that stuff can grant your vehicles cover saves, and it can also make sure that nobody can deep strike or otherwise assassinate them. So uh, bring enough bodies to balance that out, and then uh, add the artillery, super heavies, or whatever you want to, to deal the actual damage. Because uh, you cannot rely on the guardsmen to do that, but that doesn't matter because that's not their job. They're cheap enough as they are. You can make them a mini threat with adding the plasma guns, but you don't have to. I mean, you can always run them just naked. That's fine. Uh, they will die disregardless of what happens. Um, if the enemy has enough firepower, he will kill them. But at least he doesn't kill your big stuff then, and the big stuff can deal a bunch of damage. And everybody that runs against you is basic, basically playing against a timer in which the artillery will whittle down his army um, too fast. And um, if he doesn't push forward, he's probably going to lose the game. That's the great thing about these things. And also about the super heavies, because their range is obviously huge. Um, in general, I would always try to ally in stuff that helps them out. For example, Inquisition, as I already mentioned, is really, really strong. Um, and this setup, as I already mentioned, you can also ally in Inquisition as with a Psyka and two Acolytes, making really, really uh, cheap warp charges. And if you want to go a little bit more fluffy, you can uh, roll with the um, Psyanaka division from the Imperial Agents book, because uh, in this case you have to take a Vividane unit uh, to make it work, but you can have a Primus Psyker as always, the Vividanes, and as long as he's nearby them, he gains uh, Harnessing Warp Child on the 3+, which is actually really, really good, because um, the main buff from Divination costs you two Warp Charges, and it's um, you only need four Warp Charges to get it off reliably, and not five with a lower chance even. So that's nice. Um, can definitely do allies there. Can also ally in some engine seers um, for Belisarius call. Give them the uh, plasma cannon on top, and then add a fortification there. In this case, a hammer throw reactor. I played them a bunch of times. It works really well. Makes these uh, plasma blasts into large plasma blasts, and large plasma plasma blasts uh, with a possibly preferred enemy walking around is actually really, really nasty. Um, they can do very well with that and makes use of your engine seer slots basically that you usually have and they will add to the canticles of the Omnisire for call. So good in conjunction with a tank list um, because most of your tanks don't necessarily are really, really powerful against like big squads but more against small groups of squads or spread out squads because Exterminator and um, Punisher both um, tend to target those more than other stuff. Also, the gravity policy skill doesn't matter when you have a big blast. Always helps. <laughs> um, that's the majority of stuff I would ally in. Uh, you can ally in other stuff as well. Uh, as I said, Death Watch and so on. Um, but that's more like a... Um, if you know that you have an issue with uh, vehicles or something like that, you ally those in and not a general good ally rule. Because you might as well ally in some tower and then you have some great power power. But I don't think that's very fluffy and <laughs> in the end you want to play a Tau. tower. Uh, the other stuff is at least something that is stems from your codex or is meant to support your army anyway. And you can work with what you have. You don't necessarily have to go overboard with the ally party. Alright, that is it. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, it's a very, very short one. Um, but I thought it was a better idea than doing an entire codex review because that takes ages and uh, the codex is long 
long time out anyway. Um, so leave a comment uh, if you like this kind of stuff, because I obviously like to do reviews, and um, if you guys want uh, more of these, tell me in the comments below so I know, and uh, leave a like. And then I'll just continue with the series and do some something else. Can also leave, leave suggestions on what uh, I should review next. And then I'll see you guys around. Right. Thank you guys for watching. And happy wargaming.